Philip Pound Baker and welcome to COVID Cryptography. So over the past few weeks, as we've all been locked in, uh, a lot of people have been doing stuff online. And so since I'm thought of as an internet security expert, they keep coming to me and asking me, is it safe to do this? Is it safe to do that? And so I thought I would make a short course on cryptography to show people what can be made safe and what can't uh, in the internet age. So this course is for anybody who wants to understand how information is protected in the information age. What sort of protections can we apply? And also what are the costs? And by that, I don't really mean monetary cost. I mean, all this stuff is open standards based. Uh, the patents on most of it has expired. Uh, so you can do most security actually for free. But, and these days, uh, wasn't the case in the past, these days machines are fast enough to do encryption and decryption without the user even being aware that that's happening. In fact, that's happening all the time on the web. But there is still a cost in terms of convenience. And this is the real reason why most companies aren't encrypting the data that they're storing in the cloud. Encryption is really easy. You know, it just takes a few seconds. Uh, you won't notice it uh, on, in terms of the load on your client or whatever. It's really easy to encrypt, no problem. The hard part is decrypting that data so that exactly the set of people that you want have access to it. And that is a really subtle and difficult problem and one that really hasn't been solved by the software products that are out there today. And when we go to get into the later stages of this course, I want to be showing you a particular type of cryptography called threshold cryptography that was developed in the mid 1990s and addresses many of the limitations of the tool set that most of the field is trying to apply. So you've got that to look forward to. So I'm going to be showing you information that I think you need to know, not information that will help you pass an exam. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, one of them is those exams didn't really exist when I learned information security or cryptography. You know, there were no accreditations. And the second one is that when I've looked at some of the exams for the uh, accreditations, uh, it's full of material that I think is completely irrelevant. You know, the number of rounds on DES or AES, I don't know those. The only time I would need to know them was if I was implementing. And if I was implementing a cipher, well, you know, I'm going to have the specification there in front of me as I'm typing. <laughs> That's not the, some, something that anybody puts to memory. So I'm trying to give you the information you need to know, not what can be tested. So in this episode, what I want to be talking about is the foundations of modern cryptography and how real cryptography, as we practice it in industry and in the military, uh, how that differs from the Hollywood version. And, you know, you've all seen the Hollywood version of crypto in which the hacker in a hoodie breaks the code in the last five minutes of whatever, just before something goes off or whatever. And you know, those scenarios are almost entirely rubbish. We don't have really keen graphics in real cryptography. It's all rather boring math. Uh, and we don't have systems where they tell you how you're doing as you're going along. You don't have those uh, time vault uh, th counters with the dials spinning down to show you how far you've got onto the solution. No, we don't do that that would make it easier. There is one technique that does work and you can probably guess what it is and we'll come to that a bit later as well. So what I want to be talking about in this episode then is how we can tell the difference between good cryptography and bad and how in particular, how can we tell if crypto is likely to be good? And there's plenty of bad stuff out there. And, you know, it seems like every month there's another $10 million crypto startup telling me about their wonderful million bit key 
or their novel approach to cracking RSA that uh, uses patterns in primes or whatever. And it's all nonsense. And Bruce Schneier keeps a list of five or whatever telltale signs of snake oil crypto. And that's very good. And, you know, most of them I agree with. Um, but there's a problem there. And that is being able to spot the bad stuff isn't the same as knowing when somebody is talking sense. And there is actually one key way in which you can tell that somebody's talking sense about crypto and that is if they are talking about what i'm going to be talking about in this uh, module which is work factor so modern cryptography as i see it starts during world war ii people have been using it for thousands of years before that there's even a cy cipher named after julius caesar because we know that it was used in his army and, you know, there's a lot of really fascinating stuff there. And if we weren't all locked down and required to stay in base, you know, we could go off on tour and we could see some of those sites and we could, uh, you know, do a proper BBC documentary about it. What I'm going to be talking about in this course is really the crypto that came after World War II. And that is because World War II was a watershed because the war in the Pacific, just as the war in the Pacific was won by the nuclear bomb, the war in Europe from start to finish was really shaped by cryptography. And in particular, it was shaped by one particular machine. And it's this machine. This is a model. Uh, as you can see, it's a model built with modern technology. It's a model of a German Enigma machine. And this was, of course, the machine whose flaws allowed the Allies to crack it, to break the Nazi codes and defeat the Nazi war machine. This is the machine that allowed Britain to win the Battle of Britain. And that story, and this, we'll come back to maybe the story on Bletchley Park and how in particular the attack worked. But that's not quite the whole story. You see, earlier in this war, and part of the reason why Hitler was so fantastically keen on it, this is the machine that allowed Hitler to invade Poland, France and the Low Countries. The Blitzkrieg strategy depended upon rapid communications from the commanders to the field. And that was only possible because they could encrypt the communications using the Enigma machine. So just as the Enigma machine was the Achilles heel of the Nazi war machine in the latter half of the war after the codes had been broken, it was also the reason why the Nazis were winning in the early part. So, you know, one of the things about crypto is it doesn't have a moral compass. It can be good, used for good, it can be used for evil. It doesn't really have, you know, it's just pure math. And there is no morality in math. The second reason that I see World War II as being the watershed for modern cryptography is that that's when Claude Shannon was doing his groundbreaking work. And modern cryptography today, we use a nomenclature that is essentially formed by Claude Shannon's work. Uh, we use his, uh, when we talk about an encryption cipher, uh, we just talk in terms of the Input, we call that the plain text, and there's an output, the sound for text, that is encrypted using a key. On the Enigma machine, if we've got it in the encrypt mode, the input is the setting, is the keyboard here, the output is the lamps, and the key here, well, because this is a model uh, and not the real thing, uh, I don't have the cipher wheels, but there are five cipher wheels that come with the machine, and on an army or a naval enigma, the operator would choose three of the wheels and put them in a particular order that was specified by the, uh, you know, the cipher code for the day. And that would be the key, part of the key. And then there were some plugs at the start of at the, at the front of the box called the steckers. And those had to be put in a particular order. And those were another part of the key. And 
the number of combinations of the key actually on the Enigma machine was pretty large and should have made it invulnerable to attack using the techniques known to the designers. So when we're talking about um, the strength of cryptography, we come back to what I mentioned earlier, work factor. Claude Shannon defined the strength of a cryptographic system in terms of the difficulty of breaking it. So the work factor of the Enigma machine should have been the number of possible permutations of the keys. Turned out that it wasn't because it had a couple of flaws. One of those flaws was that no letter could encrypt to itself. And that meant that when somebody was reading through the ciphertexts, that was giving them a bit of a clue as to what the plain text was. And that toehold turned out to be just enough to break the system. So when we're looking at the strength of a modern crypto system, we assume that the attacker knows everything about the system apart from the key. The key is a secret thing and we assume that that is secret and everything else is known. And we define the terms of all the other fa other um, aspects of the system in terms of the difficulty of recovering the plain text if you don't know the key. But we assume that the uh, cipher is actually known. Now this is an assumption. It is not necessarily best practice. And even today, military ciphers are almost invariably classified secrets. Uh, we know what some of the NSA approved ciphers are because most of the US federal government uses ciphers that are not classified. But we do not know the ciphers that are used by the NSA. And the re there's a good reason for that. And that is, it is really difficult. It is harder to break a cipher if you don't know the algorithm. And so, um, in fact, this happened, this came up in World War II. Uh, the Allies had the Army Enigma, but they didn't have a copy of the Naval Enigma. And that stopped them from breaking the, the orders being sent to the submarines and so on, which was uh, pretty critical. And so MI6 was asked to capture an Enigma machine, and the job of working out how to do this was given to a guy called Ian Fleming. And Ian Fleming came up with a bunch of plans for stealing an Enigma machine, uh, none of which actually were put into practice because either they were impractical or by a stroke of good fortune, the Allies actually ended up capturing an Enigma machine from a submarine that was sinking and that allowed them to uh, break the codes without having to put the plan into practice. However, we do have one uh, result from that um, episode and that is this book written by Ian Fleming from Russia with Love. In the book, the enigma is called the Lecter, but the plot of From Russia with Love is essentially Ian Fleming's plot for, plan for uh, stealing a, a German enigma machine during World War II. So, cryptography is important. It has shaped the modern world. You can't understand a large part of our history without understanding the history of cryptography. It's important to do it right. And to do it right, you have to have a sufficient work factor. The work factor of an ideal encryption algorithm is the number of possible permutations of the key. So on the Enigma machines, it's all the possible combinations and orders of those cipher wheels. It's the all the possible initial settings. It's all the settings of the steckers on the front of the machine. And that turns out to be a very large number. And as I mentioned before, it was broken because it turned out that trying each key in turn, that is a, what we call a brute force attack, was not the most effective attack on the machine. So uh, the other reason it was broken was that the Allies had vastly more computing power at their disposal than the designers of the machine anticipated. 
effectively the allies invented the forerunner of the modern computer to break the Enigma machines. And a lot of that work went on later on to form the Manchester machine, the Mark I, that uh, is one of the uh, forerunners of modern digital computers. So work factor is the foundation of modern cryptography because it allows us to talk about the strength of cryptographic algorithms in objective terms and compare them one to another and also to a compare attacks. We can see, is this attack making it easier to break the code? Is it making it easier to break the code by enough to be significant? And it's a fact, it's a a concept that we're going to keep coming back to again and again because it is the central uh, theme of modern cryptography. It's what differentiates what we do today from the crossword puzzle type cryptography that went took place before World War II. So work factor is important. How big a work factor do we need? And of course we know that computers are always getting faster and they're becoming more parallel. So, they, you know, your chips have got more cores. We can put more chips in more cabinets in bigger and bigger data centers. So in the crypto world, we follow all those developments in computing and we model them over time to make sure that we're always picking work factors that are ahead of the curve. And so when I first started in the mid 90s, uh, an acceptable work factor was thought to be 2 to the power 80. Today, we use a, work, a minimum work factor of 2 to the power 128. So it's increased. And some of the time, and people like me use uh, a work factor of 2 to the power 256 uh, as routine, simply because there's no particular performance advantage in using anything less. But, you know, how, how do we justify that? Well... The reason that computers get faster and faster all the time is because of something called Moore's Law, which stated that the number of transistors per unit area in a chip doubled every three years. And so that was kind of like the metronome that kept uh, Silicon Valley ticking along and shrinking the dyes all the time. And, and when you shrink the uh, feature size on a chip, well, you also make the transistors smaller, which means that you need less charge to switch them, which means they can switch faster. And so uh, the, the speed of a computer will go up with the cube of the uh, minimum feature size reduction. So, you know, if you have the minimum feature size, you get an eightfold increase in performance. You also get an even worse increase in power density, which is why we've been lowering the uh, rail voltages. So the long and the short of it is, yes, we know why computers are getting faster. It's because the tracks on the chips are getting smaller. And you know what? Computers are getting faster and faster, but atoms are not getting any smaller. We know that there's a limit to how wide you can make that track. We know there's a limit to how many computers you can make from all the silicon that there is in the Earth's crust. And we know how that any secret that you try and keep for more than a thousand years probably isn't going to matter. And so when you multiply all these factors together, we can be very confident that 2 to the power 128 is a sufficiently large work factor that it is secure for any you know, imaginable purpose. So why do we use more? Why do we use 2 to the power 256? Well, there's a new type of computer coming along called a quantum computer that somebody might manage to get working at some point in the future. I don't think that they're nearly as close as they say. Uh, you know, they're science projects today. I've used one, but, you know, it had five bits. So, you know, they're a bit away from being able to break the ciphers that we use today. Uh, but 2 to the power 256 gives us a hedge against the algorithm being broken by a faster than brute force attack. 
and in turn so we like to use round numbers and you know since we're computer nerds you know round numbers to us are powers of two in terms of powers of 10 that's 10 to the power 38 or 10 to the power 77 and those are really big numbers the number of atoms in the earth is 10 to the power 50 and the number of atoms in the entire universe is between 10 to the power 78 and 10 to the power 80 depending upon whose model you believe so the number of possible key combinations is sufficiently large that these are not ciphers that anybody is going to be breaking by brute force in our lifetimes using any computing technology that we have available today or any imaginable uh, development of that technology um, and I'll come back to that's not quite the same for public key cryptography uh, we'll come back to the reasons for that uh, when we talk about quantum computers later on okay so I've been telling you about large numbers well there's another way we can look at it and this goes back to a story that was first published in the 13th century by Ibn Kalakan and it's a story about chess so if you've ever played chess you probably um, you probably heard this story so the chess rice problem goes uh, when the person who invented chess uh, was asked uh, what he wanted in payment he said well I'll have one grain of rice for the first square of the board two for the second twice that four for the th third twice that again for the fourth that's eight and so on for the whole of the board and this turns out because exponentials you know exponentials the very reason we're all hiding indoors these days exponentials get big really really fast so if you start off with one grain of rice on the first square of the board by the time you've got to the end of the first half of the board you're up to two 32 ton lorry loads of rice that's a lot of rice and uh, when you get to the end of the board all 64 squares well that's a, a mountain of rice the size of Mount Everest and of course if you go on for multiple chess boards you pretty soon get to more rice than there is in the universe so we're using as our minimum work factor two chess boards worth of exponentiation and that means that our work factors are very big indeed so work factors important and mathematical puzzles are important but they have to be a very specific type of mathematical pu puzzle and I hinted at, I discussed this a bit earlier when public key cryptography and I'll explain what that was that is uh, in a little in a later episode uh, when that was invented in the 1970s people became very interested in a type of problem called NP complete and even today every so often because NP complete problems are a really important problem in computer science uh, people are working on them all the time and it's very uh, very often that you see a story in the Washington Post or whatever talking about some breathless new development in computing that has some improvement on the MP complete problem that might threaten modern cryptography and I'm saying and then I get a call a bunch of calls from journalists and I say no it has no effect whatsoever and the reason is simple we don't use MP complete problems and the reason for this is that MP complete problems are problems where the finding the optimum solution is very very expensive it's exponential cost uh, one example is the so-called traveling salesman problem where you have to find the optimum path between a bunch of cities and if you have a large number of, the larger number of cities well the cost of finding the optimal path goes up exponentially but that's only in the worst case for the worst possible combination of cities 
For many cases, you can find the absolute optimal route and prove that it's optimal in much less than exponential time. And even in the case where the finding the optimal solution is still exponential, you can find a pretty good solution in an acceptable time almost all the time. And in fact, this is what's going on with Expedia Kayak and so on, you know, because they are solving the traveling salesperson problem for millions of customers a day. Well, they were when we could travel and they're doing all that in real time with a really vast number of combinatorial problems because of all the different fares and so on. And this is the reason that we don't use MP complete problems because we want a mathematical problem that's not just hard. We want a problem that gives no uh, clues along the way. You don't want something that has the same effect of one of those time vault padlock uh, graphics that Hollywood likes to show that's telling you how you are doing as you're going along. We want to have a problem that is such that you don't get any help from a near miss. You don't want, we want to have a cipher that is a key that is different by one single bit, causing the entire ciphertext output changing absolutely uh, across the board. So we want a particular type of difficulty that isn't really within the uh, corpus of uh, MP completeness. And so the next question is, how do we measure work factor? And here's the tricky bit. Well, we can't. If work factor is the difficulty of breaking the algorithm using the best possible attack, well, we don't know it because we don't know and we can never know what the best possible attack is going to be. Not until we found it, in which case, you know, if it's better than brute force, well, we've broken the cipher. All we can actually measure is the work factor according to the best known attack. And this can change over time. So the work factor of uh, MD5, which is a digest algorithm that was broken, uh, when I started using it, it was uh, to the power 64 for a particular type of attack. And today it's much less than that, you know, two to the 40 or whatever. It's been broken. And that's because somebody found an easier way of breaking it rather than a brute force attack. And this is another of Bruce's uh, aphorisms, which is attacks only get better after time. So your work factor of your algorithm, according to the best public attack, is only ever going to go down. And this is the reason why the rules for military cryptography for very well funded nation states are different for the rules for civilian cryptography. If you can afford to hire a hundred or a thousand of the world's best cryptographers and keep them uh, working in secret in a black cube somewhere, well, you can use your own crypto and you can look at all the best known published attacks and constantly monitor the security of your crypto algorithm according to those attacks. You know, you've got the money, you've got the resources, you can do it. If you're going to put a product out there that uses cryptography and sell it to the rest of the world, well, two things are going to happen. One is somebody's going to decompile your code, either using machine or by hand, and they're going to find out your algorithm. And this has happened for countless algorithms that people thought were, you know, people insisted were trade secrets that <coughs> are not. And the second reason is that um, you only, ha you don't have the ability, to, you know, unless, it's, unless you've got those hundred cryptographers working for you, you don't have the, um, ability to see whether your private proprietary crypto algorithm actually matches up to the state of the art in cryptanalysis. And it's what happens quite often is that somebody devises their own cipher in secret and 
somebody you know working in academia finds a break uh, for something that's similar and then of course the person who is working away in secret well nobody knows that they're using that particular technique not until somebody decompiles the code and you know if they're lucky well they'll tell the company that's using the proprietary crypto and if they're unlucky they'll sell it on the black market as a zero day so if you're doing civilian crypto you really need to stand insist on industry standard algorithms because it's safer traveling in groups yeah those are the algorithms that are being checked by a large number of people those are the algorithms that there's a lot of attention on if somebody devises a new cryptanalytic technique the first um, algorithms they're going to try it on are going to be AES, SHA-2, SHA-3, all the techniques that are being used widely in industry. They're not going to be using it on your proprietary crypto unless you pay them or unless they find that AES isn't vulnerable, in which case they may go looking for something else to demonstrate how clever they are. So work factor is what distinguishes modern cryptography from what went before. We use math to understand how well we're going. And the industry standard work factors are two to the power 128 and two to the power 256, which for symmetric ciphers, encryption ciphers means 128 bit key or 256 bit key. For a public key systems, it's different. Um, they're both unbreakable using conventional computing technology. Moore's law is going to come to an end before these fall, simply because even though computers are getting faster, atoms aren't getting any smaller. So that's work factor. In the next module, I'm going to be talking about cryptographic algorithms. As I showed you earlier, an algorithm converts an input to an output according to a key. And keys play a really important role in modern cryptography. A symmetric key cryptographic system uses a single key to encrypt and decrypt. And as we'll see, public key cryptography increased the power of the systems by introducing separate keys for separate roles. One key to encrypt and one key to decrypt. Later on, we're going to be looking at threshold cryptography which is not part of the normal canon, which is increases the power of the system even further by introducing even three or more keys. But what we're going to be looking at first is an algorithm that doesn't use a key at all. And this is a system called a message digest function, also known as a one-way function, a cryptographic hash function, or a fingerprint. And this is the basis for many important uh, cryptographic systems. It's used as a component in digital signatures, but it's also the foundation for the two core technologies that are the basis of a particular cipher system that uh, gets a lot of attention these days, which is called blockchain. Blockchain is based on message digest. So in the next, um, podcast, I'll show you what a message digest is and how it works. D please join me for that. And please click like so that, you know, my, uh, I can get more fans and I don't need to uh, spend all my time explaining uh, crypto one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much.